So during today's session, um, we are going to cover um, some, some general knowledge that you need to know about B2B commerce, um, the e-commerce industry as a whole, and some, some trends that we've been seeing um, in uh, future projections. Uh, next, we'll dive into a storefront demo and talk through how we can excel uh, at B2B commerce and start winning customers and selling more. Uh, and lastly, we will be discussing throughout the session um, ways that we can stand this platform up quickly and start selling. So first things first, what do you need to know about B2B e-commerce? Uh, in this section, we're going to cover the overview of the e-commerce or have an overview of the e-commerce world, um, talk about some recent growth trends, and then talk about what uh, gives B2B commerce, Salesforce's B2B commerce platform that competitive edge. So first things first, we need to define a few terms. Uh, B2C versus B2B e-commerce. So a B2C e-commerce platform uh, would be a company like Nike um, selling a, a particular set of products um, directly to a consumer. So this would be your, um, you know, your run-of-the-mill um, person. They're just hopping onto their computer, typing in Nike, um, and, and ordering some, some shoes or some products off of the website. Now, Nike has an aspect of B2B commerce sales as well. So there are distributors and wholesalers that will purchase from Nike. And that's where uh, B2B, that, and, and that's sort of what defines B2C versus B2B commerce. Now, with a B2C type e-commerce platform, um, these platforms are designed to handle large spikes in site traffic. Uh, and facilitate rapid checkouts. So think about the holiday times, how much traffic all of these sites are seeing. Um, that platform needs to be designed to handle that increased volume. Um, generally, these uh, generally B2C platforms, uh, they, they, they utilize sort of one price point and maybe some extensive use of coupon codes. Uh, meaning that if I log in, um, you know, if I log in from like any two users would see the same price point when they hit. Now, now this changes regionally, um, but generally speaking, two users from the same region hitting the same website would see the same price. Now, this is a little bit different from um, B2B or B2B e-commerce platforms. Uh, B2B e-commerce platforms are generally designed to handle uh, more complex order scenarios. So if you think about a, a potential B2C order, you're generally ordering a product or maybe a group of products um, at a particular price point. There's no business rules that necessarily need to be followed. It's either, you know, I've got this product and my customer can purchase or I'm out of stock and um, they're going to have to come back next time. Now, in a B2B e-commerce type of scenario, there could be um, you know, legal requirements that need to be met. So uh, things like medical device sales, they, they, they typically have some sort of uh, process working, operating behind the scenes that qualifies a particular uh, purchaser to like, like there's some sort of process that allows them to place that order or some sort of um, some sort of check that says, yes, this person um, is eligible to purchase this particular product. Additionally, you'll see a lot of items priced differently um, according to the relationship with the buyer in a B2B e-commerce platform. So I might have a great relationship with customer A and they receive 20% off, they receive a 20% discount off of all of my products. And my customer with relationship or my uh, my relationship with customer B is still good, but not quite as good as customer A. So they only get 10% off of all my products. Um, B2B e-commerce platforms need the ability to offer different price points to different customers based on those relationships. Um, additionally, with a B2B e-commerce platform, you need the ability to handle multiple payment types. So in a B2C scenario, credit card is generally um, generally sufficient. Almost everyone has a credit or debit card. Uh, they can go in and purchase that. When it comes uh, to selling business to business, you need that ability to accept term payments or ACH or maybe even COD. 
Um, so now that we've defined B2C versus B2B, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that B2B e-commerce platforms uh, used to face. So these older B2B e-commerce platforms uh, generally required a team of Java developers um, you know, working for eight to 12 months in order to stand up some platform. Every piece of the site had to be coded. Um, and it generally, you know, because everything's hard coded, you could go a little bit custom, but generally the goal was to start and to start selling quickly, right? We want to expose this platform rapidly and start generating revenue. We want to see a return on investment. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it took a while it, for these legacy B2B commerce platforms. It took a while to stand them up. They're not looking that pretty. And, and the biggest factor is they were disconnected from any sort of CRM. So why does that matter? Um, these days, buyers are expecting a very personalized selling experience. So we need information on that customer in order to give that experience to them. Moving into the recent growth trends. So what we're hearing from our customers. Um, so from our purchasers, we're hearing that they prefer a digital buying experience. And the vast majority would like that buying experience to be very similar to their day-to-day -day online shopping experience. Um, almost everyone you work with has probably purchased a product off of Amazon before. Um, Two-day shipping is fantastic, um, you know, and, and there's no reason why that experience can't be transferred into a B2B or into a B2B e-commerce sort of platform. Um, so one of the main factors behind this shift uh, is the fact that the millennial generation is starting to come of age. They're starting to reach that, um, reach that point in their career where they're making these purchasing decisions. So we're really catering to a generation of purchasers who grew up with the internet. Um, another thing that we're hearing is that purchasers want that per or that purchasers expect that personalized shopping experience. So again, um, you know, we really, we need to cater to our customer. And when we think about, you know, a B2C versus B2B aspect on the B2C side, when I hit a, when I hit a platform that I am purchasing off of as a consumer, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily expect that to be fully tailored to me. I know that there's other consumers out there that are purchasing from the same platform. Uh, but on the B2B side, you know, you've formed a relationship with your customers and your customers have formed a relationship with you and they expect that relationship to be um, revealed within the store in within their buying experience. So when they hit the storefront, um, you know, maybe it's just their logo up in the left or a particular image that says, welcome so-and-so. Uh, but that sort of stuff is what differentiates um, a functional platform with a uh, customer-centric platform. Now, on the seller side, we're seeing that uh, a lot of sellers are looking for new revenue streams. And especially during this, um, this unprecedented COVID-19 crisis that we're in, uh, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of our, our sellers, our manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, um, all of these people are looking for new ways to open up, uh, to increase their revenue because their normal day-to-day -day business models have been disrupted. So with that, um, they're also looking for a solution that can scale. Just because we, are, we need to respond to this particular crisis at this moment, open up some new revenue streams, doesn't mean that we want to box ourselves into one particular solution. Eventually, things will return back to normal. We'll all go back to our day-to-days. And at that point, um, you know, we need the ability to scale our platform to meet the or to uh, hit the new norm. So that is kind of what we're hearing from our sellers and our uh, and our purchasers. Uh, moving on into growth trends. Um, so from 2015 to 2020. We saw a roughly $350 billion increase in revenue generated from B2B e-commerce platforms. So in 2015, that was hovering at around, um, it was hovering at around 800 billion. And by the end of 2020, that is projected to be at 1.1 to 1.2 trillion. 
Now, if we take a look five years down the road from 2020, some uh, some projections have us put at three trillion dollars in uh, revenue from B2B e-commerce platforms alone. Another thing to kind of take into consideration is that corporations have a stronger buying power than individual consumers. So at some point, these B2B e-commerce platforms will overtake um, will overtake the the B2C platforms that we see. Um, prevalent in our day-to-day. -day. Moving on to saturation. Um, so you heard, me, uh, you heard me reference our manufacturers and our wholesalers and distributors. So roughly 40% of our manufacturers have an e-commerce presence of some sort. It may not be B2B commerce itself, but they do have some sort of platform that allows customers to go in and self-service orders. Um, so with that, you know, there's a good bit of people who are not utilizing an e-commerce platform, but of those that we, uh, of those that we spoke to over 75% of the companies said that they have intentions to begin an e-commerce or begin an e-commerce, um, implementation within the next two years. Lastly, we've seen that roughly about 10% of all B2B sales are happening on an e-commerce platform today. So that doesn't even, and that, and that doesn't account for any sales generated due to an e-commerce interaction. So one of the things that we'll touch on a little bit later in the demo is how we can extend a potential sale from the platform into a manual sale that would be worked by one of our sales reps um, within Salesforce. So moral of the story with the, uh, with the saturation and growth trends, it is the perfect time to hop into, uh, it is the perfect time to hop into the world of B2B commerce. All right, so before we hop into the demo, let's talk through some of the challenges that B2B commerce um, has solved and some of the advantages it has over competing platforms. We'll talk a little bit about the, the data model as well, and then uh, talk through what makes B2B commerce customer centric. So one of the biggest challenges solved is that B2B commerce offers a solution with clicks, not code. Um, so you heard me reference that the legacy platforms took a while to stand up. We needed a team of Java developers. With B2B commerce, it can be as simple as having a single admin stand up your, your storefront. Um, we're also utilizing a data-driven user experience with B2B commerce. So we are built on top of the world's number one CRM. Um, you know, we have all of this data from all of our additional interactions with our customers. So, you know, our marketing campaigns, um, individual deals that a rep might be working. We can see all of that within Salesforce and then tailor our user experience, uh, within the platform. Most importantly, the platform is scalable. So every, uh, every year, B2B commerce sees at least three updates to uh, platform functionality. And it can even be opened up to B2C type customers. Um, just because it is called B2B commerce does not inherently mean that we cannot sell to B2C type customers. Now on the highly flexible data model side, where this comes into play is particularly around pricing and product entitlements. Uh, because we have such a flexible data model, we can essentially address any pricing scenario that comes our way, whether it be volume-based pricing, negotiated contracts, attribute pricing. Um, you know, out of the box, Salesforce gives us a whole lot of options. And should we run into a scenario where out of the box functionality doesn't work, we've got the full backing of the Salesforce platform to build an additional process off it. And down to the customer centric piece. So again, because we are using Salesforce, because we have all of these interactions with our customers housed and tracked within Salesforce, we can look at all of this data in real time and make decisions on how we would like to uh, present the storefront, the B2B commerce platform to our customers. 
So now that we've covered a little bit about B2B, uh, the, or B2B e-commerce and the B2B commerce platform in general, let's go take a look at the storefront. So welcome to the Ad Victorium Solutions storefront. Um, right now we are on the homepage and I'm gonna sort of talk through some of the pieces here um, as well as talk through some of the, um, you know, talk through potential options when setting when setting up one of these platforms. So up here at the top, we have our navigation menu. And our navigation menu is all backed by a record in Salesforce. Again, clicks, not code. So we're setting these up as records within Salesforce, exposing them in the storefront. Now down here, we've got what we call a promotion or a, uh, a a promotion image. So a promotion image um, can be broken out into a couple different subtypes. So this would be our banner image. And if we scroll down a little bit here, we have what are called marketing tiles. So these marketing tiles, these promotion images can be linked out to your website. We can link out to particular products within uh, the storefront. Um, we can essentially link out to anything that we need to um, with these images here. And we, we, present a nice look and feel while we do that. Scrolling back up just a little bit, uh, we can see our category tree. So in order to define the click path um, that our users will take to get to a particular product, we need the ability to categorize and group our products. So that's where this um, category tree comes into play. And there's a, there's a million different ways you can slice this. Uh, a lot of the times what we see with the category tree is we might have particular products that are, um, you know, it might be a new arrival of a brand. It could be that we've got a three-day discount or a, uh, you know, a temporary hot deal going on. Um, but, but we generally use this to um, guide our customers into areas of the site that we want them to purchase from. Now up top, uh, we can have more of a traditional sort of, um, these are my products or these are my, these are my product types. So maybe segmented by brand or uh, product type there. Um, lots of different options with the way that we can set this up. And again, it's all clicks, not code. Um, the one thing to point out is that these storefronts do require a minimal amount of CSS and HTML in order to get the, um, the logo and the general um, the general color scheme um, up to your preference. But the good news is with the accelerator package that we've developed, um, we've taken about 80% of the work out of that. So you know, should we should you come on and should you use the accelerator package, um, we can get you guys out the door much quicker than a standard implementation would take. Moving right along, um, this middle component here is what we call uh, the wish lists slash templates area. So our customers can come in and um, add particular products to a wish list or template. Maybe you know, maybe they're ordering parts on a very frequent basis. Um, but anyways, it, it is a way that we can very quickly add products to our cart. Scrolling down just a bit. We can see that we have a section titled spotlight products and featured products. And this is an area that we expose particular products in order to draw attention to them. So for a spotlight product, uh, we might use this to highlight, um, you know, maybe, maybe we've brought on some fancy new widget and we want everyone to see it because this is, uh, you know, our company's initiative for the quarter is to go out and sell this thing. Featured products, um, these would be maybe their older spotlight products. So, you know, we bring a new spotlight product up into the foreground every week, then migrate them down to featured products, rinse and repeat. Another thing that we've seen used, or another thing that we've seen uh, featured products used, um, used as is a way to promote a particular brand. So all of the verbiage you see in here is all editable um, from a record as well. So we can, you know, on a weekly basis, we could switch out this verbiage here if we wanted to. Alrighty, lastly, before we move on to our product list page, wanna call out the quick order functionality. 
So with the B2B commerce platform, your reps have the ability to log in as a particular user and place orders on their behalf or set up a cart for them to check out with. Um, you know, they can come in there, assist on, um, assist on particular orders. Maybe you've got a customer who really likes emailing in. I know we all have them. Um, so, you know, you can build out that cart for them based off the email that they sent and then send them a link to the storefront so they can go check out. But what the quick order allows you to do is add in these products by SKU number. So if you've got your customer reps, you know your product like the back of their hand, um, they have the ability to add those in or add these products in very, very quickly. So that covers the home page. The next page I want to show you guys is our product list page. And there's a couple of different ways that we can reach this page. Um, and this page filters down based off of um, how we enter it. So we can enter it from one of our menus. We can enter it from one of our categories. We can use the search bar. And again, depending on how we enter it, our, our products will get filtered down and we'll see all that apply there. Now we do have the ability to apply a second layer of filtering. So we clicked into all products uh, and I wanna see all products that are developed by Ad Victorium Solutions. So I'll hit this checkbox and voila, next thing you know, we're seeing all of our products where the manufacturer is Ad Victorium Solutions. So on, the, um, on these filters here, we can have multiple filters and use uh, multiple values from different filters in order to really refine that search down. Next page I wanna talk through is the product detail page. All right, so this is what a standard single SKU product looks like within the, within the storefront. Um, some general information off there to the right you see we have that add to wish list right here. So we can have multiple wish lists if we'd like, or we can create a new one right off the bat. And then obviously the add to cart functionality. Now down here on the tabs, uh, we're seeing some additional details. We'll see that spec, so manufacturer, add Victorian solutions. And then we have the ability to add in as many tabs here as we'd like. So generally what we see is, um, you know, a tab for related products, a tab for data sheets, maybe a tab for a video about the product. Um, essentially, we, we enrich our product data and that data enrichment provides, that, uh, provides, this, um, provides this view that the, that the purchaser would see when they hit the page. Very briefly, I want to talk through the uh, different types of products available within B2B Commerce. So we just touched on a simple product. This is a product. Um, this is a product with a single SKU, no business rules behind it. Um, if it is available, if we've got available quantity, then we're saying anyone can purchase it. Um, the next, the next couple of types of products that uh, you guys might be familiar with are kits and bundles. So this is just a grouping of products set at a particular price point. Um, kits and bundles are almost synonymous. Uh, they're just, the way that they get priced is slightly different. Next, you have dynamic kits, which is a, an extension of the kit functionality. So it basically allows a customer to build their own kit. So you might have 10 types of widget A and five types of widget B. Um, we can allow our customer to pick their preferred widget A and pick their preferred widget B to customize their own kit. Um, another type of product we have is an aggregated product. So this would be something along the lines of uh, maybe, you know, the, the example that I like to use is a shirt. So I have an extra large shirt. I have that extra large shirt in three different colors, but I don't necessarily wanna show three different product listings. I wanna show one product listing and allow my customer to select the variation of that product. Um, second to last here, subscriptions. So we're all pretty familiar with subscriptions. Um, you know, it's 
we've got uh, a million different ways that we can set up that subscription pricing as well. So we can have them pay all up front. We can have them pay annually. We can give them a trial run. We can have them pay month to month. Uh, we, we have a whole lot of options around there. And lastly, we have what's called an assembly product. So an assembly product would be essentially be a picture of a product that has a whole bunch of different parts. So if we think about a bike for a minute, a bike has a bike seat, it has two wheels, it has spokes, it has a chain. So we would present this image of a bike, we would hover over a particular piece, and then we could add that, um, add a single part into our cart. All righty. So that covers product detail. We've got a couple of different um, products in our cart. Um, want to show you guys the my account portal um, before we move into the back end of this. So the my account portal is where the customer will go to view um, to view all things pertaining to their interactions with the storefront. So we can have them, we can allow them to change their account, contact, user information, lock it down if we want to, um, change password. Uh, manage address books so they can predefine shipping and billing addresses here to use during checkout. Um, then they can manage any open carts that they have. They can see a full listing of their order history and very quickly reorder that. Uh, they can manage their wish lists and templates. We can manage subscriptions back here as well. And all and most importantly, I think, um, we've got the ability to store credit card payments. Now, there is a caveat with this. We do need some sort of integration to a payment processor in order to stay PCI compliant. Uh, the good news is, is that there are a handful of what we call market templates available to us, which remove any need for us to build that integration ourselves. We essentially download a package into our Salesforce instance, and voila, we are connected to a payment processing gateway. Now, there's only a few options out there right now. Um, our preferred partner is a company by the name of CyberSource, um, and they are a Visa company. So one of uh, so we touched on one integration there um, that happens in the storefront, but generally we see three common integrations when we're building out a storefront. One would be that payment processing gateway. Two would be um, a tax calculation service. So maybe an Avalara or a Vertex. And then three would be some sort of shipping service provider. Now, depending on your company, you may not need tax. You may not need shipping. What we generally see though, is almost everyone needs a payment processing gateway. So when you are talking about potentially standing up a B2B commerce platform or any e-commerce platform for that matter, um, those are the three integration points that you really wanna keep in mind and get started quickly. Really define those requirements um, upfront and early because those integrations, um, you know, if, if there is going to be an area where, um, where you have to spend some additional unexpected time, it's generally going to be around those integrations. Lastly, on the My Account page, uh, we have invoices. So we do have the ability within uh, B2B Commerce to invoice our customers and allow our customers to pay against those invoice, invoices. So let's say our customer pays um, on a, with a terms order. Um, they can come back in here and actually pay against that, uh, that invoice. All righty. So that covers our storefront portion of the demo. Now I am going to hop into the back end very briefly. So this is what we will see um, when, we, when we download uh, B2B Commerce. So we get a B2B Commerce app. Um, this dashboard that we're seeing is custom, but it uses all reports that come with the managed package. So we've tweaked it around a little bit to fit our needs. Um, but the point is we get a whole bunch of reporting metrics right out the gate with very minimal, uh, with very minimal configuration needed in order to provide the value. 
So you heard me talking a lot about clicks, not code. Um, even with those storefront images, we it's all clicks, it's not code. So that banner is hosted by this record here, and we've simply loaded an attachment up to this record. After we load that attachment, this image then gets presented within the storefront. Additionally, we've got that uh, 360 view on the account. So we can see any open opportunities. Uh, we can put some reports specific to this account on here if we'd like to. Um, you know, we can, we can come in here and see all of our customer interactions, uh, regardless of if it is from the B2B commerce platform or not. So that covers the storefront demo. So in summary, um, with B2B commerce, you know, you're opening up an additional, uh, you're opening up an additional revenue stream. So, you know, we, we, uh, with opening up a new revenue stream, once we've gotten all the kinks worked out with the platform and everything is operating, um, the operating to your vision, you start to see that increase in revenue and we can start nurturing our internal growth. So we've got that 360 degree view. We can see our customers interactions on the storefront as well as any interactions that our sales reps might be having, our marketing team might be having. Um, and, you know, again, it's built on Salesforce. All of Salesforce is designed to scale. Another aspect that we didn't touch on too much um, is that it increases efficiency amongst, amongst your team members. So how many times has your team member had to take um, a very small parts order from a customer that could very easily be automated um, probably a lot the you know the um, with that b2b commerce platform we are allowing our customers to come in place an order like place an order at the price point that they're expecting with a personalized shopping experience so that allows our sales reps to go focus on bringing in new customers closing large deals um, you know, maybe some R&R. &R. <laughs> uh, and lastly, B2B commerce is quick to implement and quick to change. So again, we have developed this accelerator um, that's designed to reduce that implementation down, implementation time down even further. But even without our accelerator, um, there are so many bells and whistles within the out of the box version of B2B commerce that can be utilized. Uh, we didn't even have time to touch on half of them today. So, you know, a key to success there is utilize those bells and whistles, tweak those processes as needed um, to fit your business needs, and then just keep iterating over that. So you'll keep on getting user feedback. Um, you know, there, there's a whole lot of, there's, there's a whole lot that goes into designing that storefront, but it doesn't have to happen all at once. Um, a day one MVP storefront will definitely look different than a storefront that has been operating for two years. So um, with that said, let's move into some Q&A. Thank you, Sean. That's a lot of great information. Please feel free to continue sending in your questions through the questions panel, and we'll get to as many as we can. I see we do have some great questions here from our audience. First question is from Clark. What's the biggest challenge when setting up a new storefront, Sean? I would say the biggest challenge uh, lies in the build out of custom integrations. So if we don't use one of those market templates, um, those integrations can, they can slow us down a little bit. Another factor um, that I would consider a pretty big challenge is uh, it would be around data. Uh, you know, everyone has some sort of data issue, um, and sometimes it takes a little longer to sift through the data and reformat it in a way that makes sense for the B2B commerce platform. So B2B commerce does use its own set of objects, meaning that uh, just because we have products within our standard Salesforce products object doesn't mean that they'll automatically transfer over. 
Now there are some good, um, there, there are some, there are some nice apps out there on the app exchange that we can use to kind of ease this burden a little bit. Um, you know, there are connectors out there that will sync our uh, products and price books over to those B2B commerce custom objects. So there's ways around it, um, but generally what I would say is before you go down the route, before you start a B2B commerce implementation, um, take a look at your data, um, talk to someone who knows B2B commerce and uh, what it takes in order to clean up that data. And, and it might be worth having a sort of pre B2B commerce implementation initiative around cleaning that data up um, if you need to. That would speed the actual B2B commerce implementation up a bit. Great, which actually feeds right into the next quest question from Whitney. It says what the average implementation time would be. So it really depends on customer to customer. Um, what we have been doing, we, we've started to develop a COVID-19 response package. So we do have the ability to stand these platforms up in under a month. Generally, what I would say we see, though, is anywhere in between that six week to three month range. Great. And uh, one final question from Cassie. How difficult is it to restructure the home page to fit my vision? Um, it really depends. So out of the box, we have the ability to have a three column layout, two column layout or one column layout. Now we can extend the functionality of these pages um, to make it look like whatever you'd like. So this B2B commerce is built on top of a Salesforce community. And in this upcoming release, um, everything will be migrated to a true lightning community. So if you have a um, self-service portal out there or like a, like a knowledge or a publicly exposed knowledge base, or maybe, um, you know, a support community of some sort. B2B commerce is moving in that direction. Now, this is my time to say, uh, to input a safe harbor statement here. Um, you know, we're, it should be out next release. Um, that said, there may be some functionality that's lingering behind that might not allow us to go down that lightning community route, depending on your requirements. On behalf of Avatorium Solutions and our presenter, Thank you and have a wonderful day.